So before I even get started, just let me thank uh, Mr. Tom Keener and the City of Allen and the Allen uh, Public Library staff for setting up really such a wonderful event. And I also want to say a special thank you to my pastor, Dr. W.L. Stafford Sr., who canceled the Wednesday night Bible study <laughs> so that my church family could come um, tonight. And I, I did not expect Dr. Uh, Span to be here, so I'm really honored as a historian and as a human being um, to have uh, a, a, a piece of living history here um, tonight. Um, so you know, as a historian, I love nothing more than just talking about the past, the people and events that have shaped um, the world that we live in today. So in teaching and writing about African American history in particular and uh, uh, U.S. history in general, um, we are really blessed to be here today because this Juneteenth, um, 2013 is a very special uh, Juneteenth because this is the sesquicentennial or the um, 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. It's also the 50th anniversary of the um, March on Washington. And then next year will be the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So kind of compared to these monumental um, moments in history, Juneteenth might seem um, like a little small moment in time, but it really is a very significant event. And I hope to just to really share um, what I've learned about Juneteenth so that you could perhaps see it as I do. It's kind of a, the roots, really of this long um, freedom um, movement and um, it surely would have gone unmarked had it not been for those um, former slaves who were under that balcony on June uh, 19th, 1865 and who kindled that flame and kept it alive. And so now Juneteenth is one of those few celebrations that is actually um, celebrated not just here in Texas but around the country and even around the world. Um, so, what are we going to talk about uh, this evening in the next 30 minutes or so? So first, what I would really like to do is just clearly kind of explain the origins of Juneteenth, and I'm going to take a little time to dispel a few misconceptions about that day on June 19th, 1865. Then I want to kind of describe Juneteenth through time, looking at the celebration over its kind of its first hundred years, from basically 1866 to the 1970s, and and um, finally, then I want to talk about the legacies of Juneteenth, talk about the difficulty in memorialize, memorializing this period of history, which, is a, which reminds of a, us of a dark uh, past, a dark period in American history, and, uh, but how it has really come to be a celebration of freedom around the world uh, today. And of course, I welcome uh, your questions. Uh, after the um, in the uh, after the presentation in the Q and A session, so let us get started. So now, before I talk about that uh, the or uh, that moment in 1864, let me just give you a very brief background about Emancipation Day celebrations. So, African Americans really began celebrating what they would call Emancipation Day uh, during the American Revolution. So um, they did this because they were commemorating the Declaration of Independence and also this promise of liberty um, for um, uh, enslaved African Americans in the new United States. But we know that the founding generation really struggled to try to reconcile this rhetoric about freedom with the reality um, of slavery. But uh, we do know that there were uh, many northern states, most of the northern states did abolish slavery. And so that tens of thousands of African Americans for generations celebrated Emancipation Day, usually on the, on the 1st of January, but they also sometimes combined them with celebrations on the 4th of July. But Juneteenth, is something altogether different and very special. I mean, the fact that it still survives and that, has, that, has, that it's grown from this Texas tradition um, to being a, a celebration uh, commemorated throughout the United States and uh, throughout the world in places like Canada, um, Nigeria, Japan, 
uh, France, uh, South Korea, um, shows that there is something really unique and something really special about Juneteenth. It speaks to us about the past, but it also speaks to us about uh, where we are um, today. So the title of this speech, of this talk, comes from uh, this quote. When peace come, they read the emancipation law to the colored people. They, the freed slaves, spent that night singing and shouting. They wasn't slaves no more. That's former slave Pierce Harper talking in 1937 uh, and, and, re and rec recalling uh, what happened in 1865 when the slaves in Texas learned that they had been freed, emancipated two and a half years earlier by Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. So certainly the singing and the shouting and the celebrating of those slaves uh, happened quite late. Uh, so in spite of Robert E. Lee's surrender in April of 1865, at the Appomattox Courthouse, the end of the Civil War did not immediately come to Texas. I mean, it was June 2nd, 1865, uh, before the Confederate General um, Edmund Kirby Smith finally surrendered to Union forces uh, in Galveston. So slaveholders in Texas really refused to acknowledge that the war was over, and they refused to give up their slaves. Now, holding on to such a of fantasy, I know you're probably thinking, how could they um, continue to do this? But it really wasn't as hard as you, as you would think. That's because Texas was really kind of insulated during the Civil War uh, because of the Confederate blockade. There weren't that many battles that happened in Texas. This is a, a picture of the battle um, of the port of Galveston Harbor that happened in 1862. So the, the Texas was really shielded from the brunt of the Civil War. In fact, slaveholders, especially those in Mississippi and Louisiana, would bring their slaves to Texas to hide them uh, from the oncoming um, Union lines. So uh, at the end of the Civil War, there were untold you know, thousands and maybe tens of thousands of slaves that were added to the 180,000 slaves that were already living uh, here in Texas. So Union Brigadier uh, General Gordon Granger, and that's his picture there at the bottom, um, arrived uh, with, uh, with about 1,800 Union troops at Galveston in mid-July. Don't really know the exact date. But on June 19th, Granger made news of freedom official. He stepped onto the balcony of Ashton Villa, which was the former headquarters of the um, um, Army of the Confederate States of America, and he read General Orders Number 3. And this order informed the slaves that the war was over um, and that they had been freed by Lincoln with the Emancipation Proclamation two and one half years earlier. Now the reactions of these um, newly emancipated slaves was mixed. I mean, you had some people who stood in utter disbelief. Um, people shouted prayers to God, but most sang and danced right there in the streets. And I do hope that someone asks me a little bit more about the general orders in the question and answer um, uh, section. Now right here, I'm going to do a little historical housekeeping. So I wanna take a moment really to correct some misconceptions about emancipation. Now it is true that Texas slaveholders and Confederates had suppressed news of the Emancipation Proclamation uh, that went into effect in 1863. But the truth is really that the Emancipation Proclamation really didn't free that many slaves. It didn't free the vast majority of slaves. First of all, it didn't even apply to the border states, the slaves in the border states that stayed um, uh, loyal to the Union. And then, of course, the USA could no more dictate you know, what the Confederate States of America did with its citizens than Jefferson Davis um, could command Lincoln um, to leave the, quote, peaceful and contented slaves alone, lest he incite them to a general assassination of their masters, end quote. 
But more important than all that, the slaves did not wait around for a proclamation or a piece of paper to say that they were free. Between half a million to 800,000 of the three and a half million slaves, um, uh, they ran away during the Civil War. They freed themselves. They did not need a piece of paper or someone coming to tell them uh, what they had come, what many uh, African Americans had come to know, that this war was a war of freedom and emancipation, that it was about slavery. Now, uh, these uh, runaways, they ran to the north, but many of them ran to the Union lines right there in uh, the south's backyard, and many of them set up camps, and they started free communities, and this is a picture of um, one of those, what they call contraband, or one of those com communities communities, and you'll course notice the, the black Union soldiers there. Um, and those who didn't run um, were already shifting, you know, the power dynamics on the plantations and the uh, farms throughout the South, including Texas. So therefore, Africans were already forging these new visions of freedom and citizenship long before General Gordon stepped onto the balcony of Ashton um, Villa. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that Juneteenth is not important. It is. Because with that announcement, um, it was only then that Texans were forced to finally acknowledge that African American men, women, and children were now free and that they were no longer property. And the word spread quickly. Some people stayed put, um, others left immediately. They wanted to get away from their masters. Um, they, many wanted to find family members who had been sold away. Um, some people went north, some people even left the country. Um, some came back and of course some never returned. So June 19th um, became Afro-Texans uh, New Emancipation Day, or Jubilee Day as it was often called. Now the first Jubilee Day celebrations took place of course, right under that Ashton um, Villa uh, balcony. The first official celebrations began in 1866, and from the very beginning, um, the black church, which was the most important independent institution in the African American community, was really central to those celebrations. Um, the celebrations featured parties, they had uh, food, there were sporting events, um, they would have horse races, foot races, they'd play baseball games, um, people sang spirituals, Go Down Moses and Many Thousands Gone was re very popular, and in the 1860s at Peyton Colony, which was a freedom um, colony in Blanco County, uh, the Baptist church there held a special Juneteenth service, and then the children marched in a circle from the church to the school to the cemetery and then back to the church in kind of a symbolic reuniting of the free living with the uh, deceased um, and unfree um, ancestors. So this was a walk, you know, uh, in freedom. Um, they even had fireworks. So they created these by cutting holes in trees and they filled them with gunpowder and set them on fire. So by 1870, um, in Texas, uh, there were nearly 50 freedom colonies or these settlements of emancipated African Americans. And there were, uh, there were hundreds of them, but 50 of them were located uh, near Comanche Crossing in Limestone County. And that top picture, of course, is a picture of uh, Comanche Crossing. And the largest and most popular Juneteenth celebrations occur occurred right there. So African Americans also celebrated in uh, communities in Texas City in Texas cities, and Austin and Houston especially, um, were uh, very popular. They even purchased land to creating these emancipation parks to hold their Jubilee uh, Day celebrations. And here, of course, are some pictures of those uh, early celebrations. Now, there are not a lot of scholarly sources on Juneteenth. But a few people who talk about it mention that you start, they start using the term Juneteenth instead of Jubilee Day after 1900. But in my research, I've actually found that it was in the early 1890s, as early as 1891, that African Americans in their communities were calling Jubilee Day Juneteenth. And Juneteenth 
of course, it's obvious. It's just June and 19th where they cut out the nine and they squeeze the June um, and the teenth together. So by the early 1900s, Juneteenth celebrations had spread from Texas to southeast Oklahoma to southwest Arkansas and parts of Louisiana, and they rivaled uh, Independence Day celebration. So now to people looking on the outside, um, they probably saw these people celebrating and eating and playing games, and they thought of them as these kind of just jubilant uh, celebrations that took place on uh, one day a year. But during these celebrations, especially in the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s, blacks were talking about their political rights. They even had um, politicians, people running for the uh, local governments and state governments, come to the Juneteenth celebrations and picnics and stump to try to convince African to get the African American to vote. Um, they encouraged uh, the blacks in attendance to register to vote because freedom included the right to vote, and it was that right was slowly being taken away during the last decades of the um, 1800s, and of course it was pretty much completely compromised um, by um, the early 1900s. Now, Juneteenth can really teach us not just about the past, but it's, it, it's also important in our more recent um, uh, uh, history, society, and politics, and culture. So if we just look at it inside American history, instead of something that happens parallel to or outside of U.S. history, then we, th we get a deeper meaning out of what some would consider a hidden history. For example, in the late 19-teens to the 1930s, those large-scale, community-wide Juneteenth celebrations actually became less frequent. So people continued to celebrate you know, in their homes and in their churches and in their communities, but those really big county-wide uh, celebrations like the ones at Comanche Crossing um, really became almost non-existent and so existent and so I had to ask myself well you know why is that so I thought you know about looking at the 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 period what was going on in America at the time so by World War one um, the late 19 teens segregation laws firmly in place uh, there was this tide of, of nativism that was engulfing the country and so for anyone who doesn't quite remember what nativism means that means there was this rejection of outsiders this fear of foreigners and um, so I think that you know the com combining segregation racial discrimination with this with this xenophobia and uh, nativism um, led many whites and even many blacks African Americans to see June as un-American, un-American because it focused on this dark period in American history, precisely at the time that the United States was trying to show itself as this um, global power, you know, on the world stage. And so, um, ironically, uh, therefore, Juneteenth was considered unpatriotic, that celebrating it showed that you were disloyal to uh, the United States. And that time, uh, it, not only did it commemorate this really dark period, but those those were also some dark days at that time because um, th uh, this was uh, during the Red Summer, which was a wave of deadly uh, lynchings and race riots that occurred um, in the United States from 1919 to 1921. But, you know, Juneteenth is a spirit of freedom, and it refuses uh, to just die. So there's this renaissance that comes uh, in Juneteenth that occurs shortly before the United States goes to World War II. And the really important catalyst for um, this, uh, this, this renaissance happens right up 75 in Dallas, Texas. So you have Antonio Maceo Smith. He's an educator, and he, he's, he's head of the Dallas Negro Chamber of Commerce, and he's trying to lead efforts to create this commemoration or um, an exhibit of African-American life and culture for the Tex Texas sesquicentennial in 1936. Well, the state fair organizers refuse, and so Smith does not give up. So he goes 
over their heads to the federal government, and he actually secures a $100,000 grant, and he uses that money to build the Hall of Negro Life on the state fairgrounds. Now, local white leaders protested the construction of the hall, but there was nothing that they could do. It was completed, and it was dedicated on Juneteenth. 1936. And so over 46,000 African Americans streamed into the state fair um, grounds for the largest Juneteenth celebration ever held up to that time. Now the hall unfortunately was demolished soon after the fair closed, but that spirit uh, uh, that rekindled spirit, uh, they could not destroy that. And so then it was after 1936 that the Juneteenth celebration um, was revived in these more public co um, commemorations. That's because African Americans now were emboldened um, because of the, their success during the centennial. And also this was world, uh, in the 40s, you had World War II, and, and African Americans were fighting for what they called a double victory. So there was a victory over fascism abroad and a victory over racism um, at home. And so these Juneteenth celebrations in the 40s and the 50s really highlighted this idea, the rekindled this idea of equal rights. Um, they would also honor former slaves and um, uh, African American veterans. Now, during the civil rights movement that really started to kick off in the, in the mid-1950s um, through the 1960s, many blacks really were more conscious you know, about drawing the connections between their present day movement and their ancestors' historical struggles for freedom and for equal rights. So uh, in debate and reactions surrounding the Civil Rights Act, uh, many made the explicit connection between that act and fulfilling the freedoms that were first guaranteed in the Emancipation Proclamation and that the Juneteenth uh, you know, general orders show this deferred um, freedom. So President John F. Kennedy mentioned the Emancipation Proclamation in a speech calling for um, federal civil rights uh, legislation and after his assass um, assassination, LBJ pushed through the bill and one of his aides told him, quote, it's equivalent to signing an Emancipation Proclamation, end quote. So the deferred freedom that was celebrated during Juneteenth speaks to this struggle for equality and rights that continued through the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And the activists in, 19, in the 1960s also made those connections, well, like I said, clearly made those connections to Juneteenth. The organizers of the 1968 Poor People's March held a Solidarity Day rally, and they held it on Juneteenth. 1968. And African Americans attended from all over the country, and so after they returned home, they either revived or they initiated Juneteenth celebrations in their hometowns around the United States. Now, as the Civil Rights Movement gave way to black power, celebrations in the 1970s focused more and more on black, um, on black pride and, Africa and, and cultural heritage. So Houston was among the first of Texas cities to rekindle um, more of these large-scale um, celebrations with an annual blues festival that they held in Herman Park starting in 1973. So I don't know if anyone's ever gone to one of those. And of course, by the uh, 1980s, states throughout the country held these major Juneteenth celebrations. They included music, art, and expressions of African American heritage. And I had to really put this picture which is a more modern picture of the Gullah Geechee uh, Low Country uh, celebrations, because I spent a week um, last summer in um, in Savannah, and uh, actually on some of the islands, uh, the the, uh, the Gullah Islands, and they have just such a unique way of celebrating that Af that Gullah African. Um, American heritage and combining it with Juneteenth, uh, even in um, Georgia. So I just wanted to, to mention that uh, special. So, in, uh, so now we're going to just kind of close up as we talk about a memorializing Juneteenth. How is it that we remember or, or, or give honor to what we don't feel comfortable remembering sometimes? So what happens is in 1979, Representative Al Edwards, he's a Democrat, 
Um, he, he lives in Houston, and he introduces House Bill 1016. Um, and this bill is uh, an effort to make Juneteenth a state holiday. And so there's a coalition of African American, Latino, and Anglo legislators who work together to support the bill and to make Juneteenth, and, and it succeeds, and it becomes the first official state emancipation holiday. The legislature signed the bill into law on June 7th, 1979, um, right uh, a week before um, Juneteenth. So Edwards then pushes for um, a Juneteenth memorial. And there was a five statue memorial that was completed in 1999. However, due to some you know, political wrangling, uh, there were some fundraising difficulties. There were some controversies uh, about the historical accuracy of the um, monument and the fact that um, one of the statues bore a striking resemblance to Representative Edwards. Uh, it was not until 2005 that, that that one part, one statue of the memorial was installed near Ashton Villa in Galveston, Texas. And that is the statue in the middle, and that's the preacher um, and that's the one that looks like, just like, uh, Representative Edwards. And um, unfortunately, in 2011, the Texas legislature voted to end um, any appropriations or consideration of the Juneteenth Memorial Project and decided to in instead to install a, a kind of a new monument, an Afro-Texas monument um, in Austin that would be similar to um, the proposed Tejano uh, monument. So today, people of all races and ethnicities and nationalities in the United States and the Caribbean and Europe and Africa and all over the world celebrate Juneteenth. And the fact that Juneteenth has really endured as a national and an international celebration for nearly, one, for over 150 years, you know, shows that it is one of those small, you know, historical moments, but it's really a significant um, time in U.S. history. So we should not see Juneteenth as the commemoration of this old um, day in the past when the African when the slaves gathered um, in Galveston in 1865. You know, because it has really come to mean different things uh, to different generations. So Juneteenth tells many different refrains of the struggle for freedom, uh, the, the struggle for African Americans, to immigrants, to activists, um, even today who are um, fighting for social change. So those celebrations the, the, uh, that have taken place, especially since the 1930s and rekindled and changed uh, in the 1970s. Um, yes, they forced Americans to really deal with this gap between the promises of freedom and democracy and the realities of racism and discrimination, but it has also, I think, shown and borne out the fact that America, the you know, United States, is really the beacon of freedom and democracy. And I would think that um, those ancestors who kept that flame alive uh, through all these um, years would be very proud uh, to know that the freedom that was deferred to them today, that we, of course, can enjoy it today. So I really thank you and appreciate um, your listening. Thank you very much. You would like for us to ask you a little bit more about the general orders, so you can expound upon that, please. Ah, yes, <laughs> yes. The general orders. Let me see. Oh, I don't know if I can go back. The general orders um, are, uh, it was really seen as really unimportant in Texas. And actually, there's like uh, only like three surviving copies. And uh, the Dallas Historical Society has a copy on display um, at uh, the Hall of State in Dallas. But if you were to actually read the general orders, uh, and I can imagine that the African Americans who were sitting, uh, who were standing up under that, um, that balcony, those that were looking in disbelief, they probably were really listening to what the orders say. And actually the orders um, kind of show the difficulties uh, of dealing with the emancipation after the Civil War. They don't really promise 
the former slaves very much of anything other than freedom. In fact, it encourages them to basically to kind of uh, fend for themselves, maybe go on back to the plantation and strike up a deal with their former masters because um, the, the, the federal government really wasn't prepared or desirous of doing very much for them. So uh, uh, it, that's why it's, it's always really kind of important to look at these primary sources, uh, even the, reading the Emancipation Proclamation yourself, and just kind of uh, thinking about what people at the time uh, would have felt and thought when they uh, heard and saw those things. Yes, sir? So that issue raises the question of what was, you know, what were the actual economic impacts of this transition? I mean, that's what that goes to is, is that you would have immediate unemployment all over the place and, and the industries would fall apart. So what, what actually happened and how much actual economic disruption occurred? Oh, the Civil War was the ultimate economic disruption. So it wasn't just that the agricultural industry was disrupted, but really the, that, the um, cotton, for example, was the number one export in the United States. And then behind that were these slave-produced uh, foodstuffs. So it was in the interest of not just the, the Southerners, but even of the federal government to get African Americans Get get southern um, southerners back to growing the the crops that they needed to rebuild the United States after the war, and that's also why that period of Reconstruction um, was had this promise of freedom, but the reality is that it ended up kind of returning blacks to a state of quasi slavery. So that so the impact was devastating for African Americans, especially those who kind of believed that this was freedom come, you know, peace when peace come. Um, but it also um, has, I mean, but it's not something that I don't think that we should, we should turn away from because it is here this long struggle for freedom where we get not just African Americans um, trying to cash, trying to activate the promises of freedom, but also the United States growing into the role of freedom and democracy that it promised. It has been promising its citizens to become that beacon, to become the place um, that African Americans, you know, basically hoped that it would be at the end of the Civil War. So that's why I don't think that we should shy away from talking about slavery or the Civil War, that we actually should embrace it. You know, I love the food in the South and all the things of the South, but was there anything really characteristically different about how they celebrated in the North and the South? We know the food in the North wasn't as good, but... <laughs> um, are you talking about with Emancipation Day celebrations or just as, as, as it spread? Uh, well, the Emancipation uh, Day celebrations, as I, as I looked at them and read them, um, they were, they were, they were kind of traditional fare because it was cold in January. They reminded me a lot of Thanksgiving. You know, that people would kind of sit around the table, kind of dressed up, and, uh, and, and, and enjoy, you know, the holiday and commemorate uh, Emancipation Day. But I think of what's, what's wonderful about Southern foodways and foodways, and African American, you know, foodways in general, is that, um, you know, they just have filtered through the entire country, and so today, I mean, you have just this wonderful uh, celebration of kind of traditional uh, Southern food, but then especially, I mean, especially if you go to like the low country, you also have um, the Gullah foods, which tend to be, um, uh, you know, seafood, and it's, it's very different, you know, how they celebrate and commemorate the, um, around the country. But barbecue and watermelon and red soda and water, <laughs> it's kind of standard. <laughs> Thank you so much for your interesting presentation. Um, can you tell us more about Comanche Crossing? Uh, where is it and why was it a popular place for Juneteenth early celebrations? Now regarding why uh, Comanche um, Crossing is so important, um, if I, I think that it was really important because it was in rural, it's in Blanco County. Um, I'm, I'm horrible 
with directions, so I couldn't tell you exactly where the, I don't know if it's Central Texas or East Texas, but it's Blanco County, B-L-A-N-C-O. And rural Texans, rural Afro-Texans had a lot more freedom to um, buy land and create those rural uh, communities, those freedom colonies. And in fact, as I was doing my research, I was trying to find out what was going on here in Collin County. And uh, I found out, for example, in 1870, that uh, Collin County residents burned down the African American school. But there was an, uh, <laughs> there was an African American community, I think Douglas Street, which is near uh, Plano, um, which is in Plano, I think uh, four miles or so, I don't remember, east or west from uh, downtown Plano, uh, was one uh, African-American community. But in Collin County, as it would, in Grimes County, was another county, um, many of the whites banded together to try to prohibit African-Americans from buying land because they wanted to basically chase African-Americans out of the county. So it was in rural areas like um, uh, Blanco County and that Comanche Crossing, that African Americans had a lot more freedom and opportunity to create their own uh, independent communities where they could celebrate things like Juneteenth and those things that were important to them and build those institutions like schools and churches. Just to speak to the gentleman who asked about the, the food in the North, <laughs> I am from the North and we <laughs> celebrated Emancipation Day but we celebrated on August the 1st. Everybody oh. was going down to the river with the churches and mm -hmm. civic organizations because Newport, Rhode Island was, as you know, a slave trading place. And so there were many, many slaves in that area. Yeah, and, and actually the Emancipation Day was celebrated on different days because different states in the North emancipated their days, their slaves, slaves at different times, and it was gradual emancipation. I don't want anybody to imagine that they just let the African Americans um, free them. Uh, but Rhode Island is also really important in my own study because that's kind of where one of the earliest um, African mutual aid societies was founded in uh, Rhode Island. Would you say immediately after uh Order 3 was read, and even the Emancipation Proclamation, was the sharecropping system like immediately enacted, or did it take time for them to really get into it? Because you did say that the former slaves were able to make more demands, but from what I've learned um, from getting my degree in history and then in my history classes, that sharecropping, in theory, they were able to get more, you know, ask for more things, but in reality, it basically, it basically was like you said another form of slavery. So I just wanted a little bit more. Well, and looking at sharecropping, um, it's in sharecropping actually that you really get that sense of that door closing because um, African Americans were able to, sharecropping was this kind of compromise in uh, trying to deal with the fact that now you're dealing with free labor. Uh, these African Americans and the South is cash poor. And so there was this idea that you would share the proceeds of the crop. So in exchange for the, the own planter providing the land and maybe some of the materials, the seeds, et cetera, then African Americans and, and poor whites too would work the land and then at the end share uh, part of the crops, part would go to the planter, landholder, part would go to the sharecropper. And in those contracts, many African Americans were able to make, to put some of those demands on paper. Um, in fact, there are some, some wonderful essays about uh, um, masters being upset that the wives aren't out working alongside um, their husbands and these, uh, these, these, this wanting to live farther away and have independent homesteads and an opportunity to educate their children. But it was the Freedmen's Bureau that really helped to enforce some of the uh, provisions in those contracts. And so once Reconstruction was over and the federal government left, and so then the Freedmen's Bureau left, African Americans lost that leverage that they had had. And so it, they were then, the, the, share, the, the, the planter then was able to more fully exploit them. And that's also when you have the passage of, you know, vagrancy laws and there's the, the um, the convict lease system, et cetera. There's this new book out that's the New Jim Crow talking about the kind of a, the convict lease system that emerged out of the sharecropping and even today when they're talking about the prison industrial complex as a kind of new uh, sharecropping arrangement with African Americans. 
and people of color, not just African Americans. Um, you were talking about when there was a hall of African American history that was built in the Texas State Fair. Yes, the Hall of Negro um, Life. Yes. Mm. Um, I was under the impression that in the 1970s, I, I believe it was the 70s, there was a protest so that African Americans could actually attend um, other than one day every year, uh, attend the Texas State Fair. Um, so when were African Americans uh, allowed to go to Texas State Fair and when there, were they excluded to where it was only one day? They always had a colored day at the, at the State Fair. Sometimes it was, well, but, but at first it was called Colored Day <laughs> because Booker T. Washington spoke at Colored Day in 1900. Um, uh, and so African Americans always attended the State Fair on a segregated um, day. And um, they always struggled, you know, to, to kind of open up um, 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 the fair. And actually, when people talk about, uh, so the, but the Hall of Negro Life was a beautiful hall. I mean, it had these murals that depicted African American life from slavery up, up, um, up to, the, uh, well, to the 1930s, and especially in Texas, um, created by Harlem Renaissance, you know, um, painters and sculptures. And it was a beautiful hall. It's just so unfortunate that it was destroyed, especially when I see how beautiful the, uh, the Hall of State is. So um, it was, uh, so many people, actually I am, I have so many different projects, but I am working on this project on the Dallas Negro Housewives League and the invisible civil rights movement in Dallas because a lot of people don't think there was really a civil rights movement in Dallas because we didn't have any major um, marches like in Selma, you know, akin to Selma, but there was a really um, uh, vibrant uh, movement in Dallas, especially in, in uh, Fort Worth too, um, and 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 the state fair, desegregating the state fair was one of the kind of the really important uh, arenas that African Americans one of the one of the signs of segregation that they wanted to uh, tear down. So that was a really important part of the civil rights movement in Dallas.